All right, welcome to OK Computer. I'm Dan Nathan. I am joined with Deirdre Bosa. She is the host of CNBC's Tech Check. D, welcome back. It is great to be back. You've been you've been gallivanting around Europe. I've I've been here in the studio most. I have but. been ga- I have been gallivanting, <laughs> and I think that makes a whole heck of a lot of sense, given um, just that my butt has been in the seat for like three and a half months straight, just podcast. You deserve right it. Here. Well, there you go. I just want to give myself a little uh, pat on the back. You and I have a lot to talk about. There's actually news breaking um, on pricing of Microsoft's Copilot. This is the 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 AI kind of fueled platform that's going to be a subscription service on top of uh, Microsoft 360. So we're going to talk uh, about all of that here. Also, stick around. Um, We're going to be going into earnings season. We got a bunch of stuff kicking off. This is Wednesday after the close. When you're listening to this, we have Tesla um, and Netflix after the close. And I think those will kind of set the tone for tech earnings season D. But um, also, you know, I had a great conversation with a really good friend of mine, uh, Dan Turan. He is the co-founder of Gutter Capital and he brought along Rachel Nemeth, who is the CEO and co-founder of Opus. This is a digital platform that is um, really focused on some of the, the kind of working uh, skills gap that exists in this country and training deskless workers. So it was a really uh, interesting conversation um, that we had there. All right, let's get into it, Dee, because it is basically midday on Tuesday as we are recording this. And, you know, it's kind of a funny day in the markets because we had some of the big tech names selling off as a lot of the bank stocks were rallying after better than expected earnings over the last couple of days. And then all of a sudden, this this uh, this headline uh, about Microsoft and the pricing of their co-pilot comes out in the stock rallies three and a half percent in a straight line. Let's let's talk about what the news is. I'm sure you're going to be um, talking about this a whole heck of a lot on CNBC for the next couple of days. Yeah, so I was actually on TV talking about the air coming out of the AI bubble a little bit, and then this hits, and as you said, the stock shot up. Um, And the reason I think it shot up is because both things can be true. The air can be coming out of that AI hype bubble a little bit, but then being reinflated by actual dollars and cents. And that is what investors want to see. I think they're tired of this user growth, unprofitable user growth. And what Microsoft is saying is they are going to charge, what is it, $30 per user for a suite of generative AI tools. And that is going to hit the bottom and the top line. And as we head into earnings season, I think it's no longer good enough just to, you know, say you have you slapped a chat bot onto certain parts of your business. You're going to have to show that you're making money from them. And that's what Microsoft essentially is doing here. And investors, they have to believe that businesses are going to pay for this. Right. But, you know, it's funny. OK, so I just just to be really clear, the stock has rallied 5 percent off of its lows today since that headline hit. And, 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 and again, OK, $30, you know, I, there, there's a headline here that, um, you know, in the story that I was just reading here, Microsoft's chief financial officer, Amy Hood, has said the company's new AI products will become the software company's fastest business to hit $10 billion in revenue. OK, and that makes total sense. But here's my only issue. If you think about a 5% rally on a $2.5 trillion market cap company, what is that discounting, right? So if you want to say the fastest business to $10 billion, we can back into what all of these subscription services could be by like user growth and this and whatever. But at some point, then it just becomes a recurring revenue stream. They're going to obviously continue to grow that business and add other things on. They're going to continue to lose some enterprise customers. We don't know, you know, a, a essentially what the margins are going to be in the near term because the cost of the compute, right? Like all of the build yeah, up, good point. you know, so it's going to cost in CapEx, right? right? Them getting these customers, it's also going to cost them more on the back end. So you're saying the move may be not justified too bad. Well, listen, it's at an all-time high, okay? You know, we have a NASDAQ that is at shooting distance from its all-time highs here. It just rallied 5%. I just think that it's interesting that you were on air talking about some of the air coming out. I think what you were <laughs> speaking about a little bit was that some of the semi-stocks had kind of sold off, you know, NVIDIA has been banging around here over the last few days on Friday afternoon. It kind of had a late day um, sell off. And, and, and again, you know, um, you know, some of the valuations on some of these things are getting a bit sort of stretched here. But a headline like that can pro- propel a move like that is pretty interesting at this stage of the game day. Yeah. So maybe some of the air is coming out of this generative AI hype bubble, but just a little bit, right? We're still in this moment where this is sort of the most exciting technology for investors. And I think also this belief that the biggest tech companies are going to dominate the space. The piece I was doing was on the startup world, right? And you have all of these AI companies raising hundreds of millions of dollars at billion dollar plus valuations. And they're essentially all doing the same 
thing. And what Microsoft sort of put out today, a suite of products that you can use if you're a Microsoft customer, is actually more of a case against this sort of bubble in the private markets, all these companies that are getting funding for essentially doing the same thing that Microsoft maybe eventually will do itself that you don't need another platform or product. This is just a feature that another big tech company has. Yeah. And it's interesting because if you think what Microsoft is leveraging off of OpenAI, which was obviously, uh, you know, a startup, it's a very large startup right now with a huge um, valuation. And when you think of where all the, 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 I know you talk to a whole bunch of VCs on a daily basis here, as do I, um, it just seems like there's just tons of money going to just a, a really narrow subsection of, of kind of AI um, startups right now. And I think you make a really great point is like, you know, how much of a, a, a lead do some of these platform companies have and how will these, you know, smaller startups be able to compete? And we just honestly don't know, but there's going to be a lot of garbage that gets funded at valuations where companies are never going to be able um, to kind of grow into a little bit. So I'm just curious, like how you're thinking about that, because, um, you know, we do run the risk of a, a mini bubble being inflated in the private tech markets at a time where I think a lot of VCs are trying to find a bottom, right? It's been a pretty rough, you know, 12 to 18 months or so. And now all of a sudden you have hundreds of millions of dollars that are chasing after some things where the biggest competitors are massive incumbents who already have big leads right. at the moment. <laughs> so there's this bifurcation, right? In in private markets and public markets, you could say as well. There's AI and then there's everything else. And this is known as the so-called VC winter. We haven't seen sort of fundraising numbers and figures this brutal in years. Even, you know, the VCs themselves that are raising funds, raising money from LPs. It's just been a really tough environment, except if you are a generative AI company. And you're right, it is ironic, um, Dan, because the big guys, the incumbents, are going to do a lot of these things, but that's the VC model, right? It's spray and pray. You want to give as much money as possible because you got to put money to work and you hope for that one open AI to raise money at, you know, $10 billion plus valuation. And then it all pays off for those ones that eventually go bankrupt and go away. And this is a really good segue too, because you use the term VC winter. And I saw you on Friday um, with Kate Rooney, um, you know, discussing some of this, you know, like with, with, with SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, you know, leaving the kind of venture debt market. And this was really, you know, something that where, you know, um, a lot of VCs were encouraging um, when, when, when SVB was, was there and open for business, you know what I mean? For many of their portfolio companies to kind of tap into that relationship and get in the way you guys framed it, I thought was, um, really great here. And with the exit of SVB, now a lot of these companies with pressure on valuations, with maybe kind of slowing growth, if you will, you know, the idea in, in, of doing down rounds, you know what I mean, is not something that's particularly um, palatable. And I just mentioned, you know, the banks are screaming um, over the last few days. I mean, JP Morgan just broke out. And I think it's really interesting that a lot of people thought that we did a pod in the throes of the SVB meltdown. And I remember talking with you and Jeff Richards and, and Rick Heitzman, we were like, is JP Morgan going to to step in? Are they going to buy SVB? And, you know, all of you guys said, I don't think so. But it's funny that this headline caught me. And this is a guy that you might know, John Chino, who had been at SVB for a very long time and thought to be a really, really talented guy as it relates to kind of their positioning and the VC and the tech growth sector. And JP Morgan just hired him. So they didn't, they didn't buy SVB. They didn't buy any of the assets, but they hired some of the brains. So talk to me a little bit about that, because it seems that JP Morgan is going to be extremely well positioned if they want to build something that looks like SVB within a massive money center bank and, and a huge infrastructure as it relates to investment banking. You're going to make me eat my words here, aren't you, Dan? I think I think you're right, though. I mean, credit where credit's due and that I don't think we thought that JP Morgan could come in and fill the space. And I will say there's a little bit of a distinction here. JP Morgan is no Silicon Valley bank and venture debt is different than debt financing for a startup, right? They don't necessarily translate into options and warrants and a piece of the company in the way in which SVB did. So yes, and, and I do hear that actually, that JP Morgan is stepping in as a compelling case, but and maybe correct me here if I'm wrong, Dan, but they're looking for a different kind of funding. They want companies that are already on a path to profitability or profitable or have positive cash flow. And if you're that kind of company, you can do some reasonable debt financing. But if you are a company in its earliest stages that is losing a lot of money, that has a yet 
to be proven business model. I think you're in a really tough place. JP Morgan, private financers, they're, they're not going to fund you in this environment. No, I, I think that's a really good point. I think the JP Morgan's angle is that they want to have, they want to be in the catbird seat where it used to be, you know, Goldman and Morgan, everyone, you know, if you are the next Uber or whatever the heck it is, you kind of need them to be lead left on your IPO. Right. And so I think this is probably a move to kind of solidly put themselves in that top three position. And then when you think about the size of the bank, the size of the deposits, right? Like they can do a whole host of things um, that smaller investment banks that SVB certainly couldn't do at the size in which they were, right? So I think they're thinking later down the life cycle and they want to be, you know, a lead left on the biggest tech IPOs from here on out. Can I just say, I haven't heard the words lead left <laughs> in like over a year. It's just music to my ears. The, IP mo uh, the IPO market has been frozen for so long and I'm excited for these signs. They're really small right now that it could be opening up. But you're right. That's exactly what this is all about. There's this competition between the big banks to win this business. And of course, the most lucrative business is here in Silicon Valley and the tech companies. Um, so right, that positioning, that jostling has already started. I did hear from a friend of mine here who's in um, corporate financing that HSBC did acquire, right, SVB's, some of SVB's business, but he was sort of arguing that they don't really have the culture to capitalize on it. So he was sort of agreeing with you in that JP Morgan is best positioned to take this business. But again, Silicon Valley Bank's business was broader than just financing, right? They would do mortgages. They would do personal loans. They did wineries. There was this whole ecosystem here from the startup to the founder to the supporting industries. Um, and I, I don't know if that's going to be easily replaced. Yeah, no, uh, you know, no doubt. You know, back to the IPO thing, it, it's interesting because, you know, there was that Kava deal and that's kind of a small deal and it's not tech. It's a, it's a restaurant, that sort of thing. But it was a consumer facing brand. And I think that, you know, if you're going to get the public again interested in new issues, they have to be, you know, generally, I, I think in this kind of environment, things that, that consumers or investors, they know the products, they can touch and feel them, that sort of thing. That's probably a good way to kind of get back in there. But at the end of the day, you know, like some of the biggest deals that uh, that a lot of us have been waiting for, like the stripes of the world. I mean, these are these are companies that were going to be hundred billion dollar, you know, minted hundred billion dollar market cap companies, you know, two years ago if they were to go public, and and the latest rounds have been cut in half or something like that. So it'll be interesting to see with the Nasdaq up. 35%, still down about 10% from its all-time highs in late 2021, if we are going to see one of these things test the water, because I don't know about you, man, it feels like pretty euphoric out there. It feels like, you know, you got something hot and there is a buyer for it in the stock market. You know what I mean? I mean, for some, but again, it's, it's the bifurcation that I mentioned before. It's AI and it's everything else. And even you look at the Magnificent Seven, they're all sort of playing into generative AI, some in more concrete ways, some in much, much looser ways. But And they're the giants. They're already big. They're seen as the winners because they have the scale. Whereas, I mean, an Instacart that's not really you know, involved in the AI space, that's part of the gig economy, that still continues to be not all that impressive, I think that's a harder proposition. So I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not hearing that there's any rush. I think ARM will be really interesting. The SoftBank chip design, SoftBank backed chip designer, because it certainly plays into the whole AI hype cycle and SoftBank and all these interesting places. All right, let's let's move to some um, earnings here because Wednesday after the close, we're going to have Tesla and the implied move in the options market is about 6%. So do the math, 6% on a $900 billion market cap. Okay, like th this thing is expected to move one way or another. And if I go and look and see how this stock has moved over the last four quarters, it's moved on average about 8%. Okay, so think about that, right? And so in the last four quarters, it was a much smaller stock here, but this thing has gone absolutely ballistic. Um, it made a low, I think, in the first week of January of $100. We're trading um, very near $288. It feels like, again, things that, um, you know, you, you've probably noticed this in, in your career covering the stock market. I mean, when things uh, go to nine, they usually go to 10 or 90 to 100. You're at 900 billion. Maybe we get to, you know, back to a trillion. This was a trillion dollar market cap company, um, you know, prior to its collapse. Um, I also would make one point, D, is that, you know, stocks that sell off 75%, which this stock did from its highs from late 2021 to its lows earlier this year, 
they can do it again too. Now, it just doesn't feel like anybody's worried about anything right now, but I got to tell you, there's a massive price war going on. And, and we saw it in the way GM and Ford traded on Monday. I think both those stocks were down four or 5%. Ford is slashing the price of what we thought was this great electric F-150, right? With cr- tremendous, they dropped the price by 17%. And we have a situation with Tesla where their gross uh, margins, uh, automotive margins are expected to be, I don't know, they came in at like, what, a little over 19%. There's some suggesting they could be as low as 17%. That's not too far away from Ford in GM. How do you justify the valuation here? We already have the deliveries for Q2. They were up 83% year over year. It was a pretty easy comp, right? Making it look really good. Is there anything that can take this stock down or make it correct here? I understand what you're saying, but I also think there's another way of looking at that F-150 price cut is that, you know, Jim has had to do that. Sorry, Ford has had to do that so much earlier than Tesla has had to. I mean, they don't even really have that product out there in any scale or anything yet. And they're already doing that. So I think that Tesla comes from a bigger position of strength. But in terms of that demand and EV demand overall, it is a good question. And the Chinese automakers and Tesla's presence over there. um, What do you make about the charging networks? Because I think that that has been a major catalyst for the recent rally we've seen. Yeah. I mean, like, I just say it's a plug, you know, I mean, like literally it's a plug, you know what I mean? So, so like, for instance, you know, I've always thought, and I had a Ford um, Mustang Mach-E um, a couple years ago, and it just doesn't, it didn't work for me in a city like New York, partially because of the charging situation. I'm not telling you that if I had access to the Tesla, you know, supercharging network, that that would have made my experience um, any different. And so like, to me, is it, is it like a, you know, hundred billion dollar opportunity um, for Tesla because they have this early lead in the build out of these things. It, it really could be, you know, I, I don't know um, at the end of the day, I guess the bigger issue is, is that if Tesla really does have automotive margins that are like 17 and they stay there, then it is an auto company unless this other things start to happen. Full self driving, the build out of, Robo the, taxis. you know, like all that sort of stuff. And, and, and again, you know, I just take investors or I take listeners back to what happened last year from its highs. I mean, you couldn't give this stock away nine months ago. You know, you know, you know what I'm saying? And so, and now they're buying it up to 300% or something like that, trading at a crazy multiple when make no mistake about it, the competition is here. Okay. And the price war is here. And as long as I've been investing in tech, anytime that you have a price war, okay, in a very, very hot market like this, and you have that sort of margin pressure, it generally does not end well for valuations. Now, the market is saying something very different right now, but I think it's also important to remember that can change pretty quickly too. Right. I think though the bulls, and if you are, you're you're not thinking of this still. I know that where the margins are going it's looking more like an automaker than a tech company, but Elon Musk is so focused on artificial intelligence yet to prove itself certainly. And I don't think we have a good gauge on whether it's going to be a winner in this space, whether he's actually going to have a network of robo taxis, but that's what the bulls grab onto. And I do kind of go back to just the remarkable fact that you can do a recall over software over the internet you know, and that's, it's just been such a game changer and it's taken the other auto companies just so long to get there or get even close to it. And even what Tesla did during the pandemic with its chips, it's just a better operated. It is, it's an, even if it's an automaker with technology characteristics, so much better than some of the others. And I don't know if that justifies its valuation. You're in a better position to judge that than I am. But I think that it rests on this idea that Musk has something up his sleeve. Yeah, I think that that's generally, you know, what most investors who are willing to kind of pay the multiple they are for the stock, that's what they kind of always feel. It's a question, though, because Elon Musk is coming back down to ground, right? I mean, Tesla's firing on some cylinders, but you've got Twitter, (laughs) um, which is not which is not doing so well. And so, you know, he's not he's not untouchable. Not everything he touches turns to gold. Well, let, let, let's talk about that really quickly. Um, you know, I keep hearing this um, from some folks here, like when I'm talking about Twitter and what's going on there, and I know you've been reporting on this. I mean, you know, revenues are expected to be down, you know, 50%. They, they can't keep advertisers. This new um, CEO, she really does look like a figurehead in something that, you know, Elon never was going to like kind of lock into that business model of, of ad supported, right? So we wanted to go with, um, you know, the subscription service. It doesn't seem to be working here. And so with the introduction of threads and getting to 100 
100 million users. And I'm just curious, like, what, what are some of your quick takes um, on threads? Because I heard this a couple times this week is like, if this really does um, take steam here and they're able to kind of do this in, in, in an ad supported way, but they don't even need to monetize just yet, that would be meta, you know, Elon could find himself in a position where he literally does, and he's threatened to do this. He suggested this. He could just bankrupt the company and he could put the banks that are on the hook for $13 billion. He could basically just say, that's it. I mean, he could still operate the company, but you wipe out, you know, like basically the existing equity. Um, the banks, you know, are going to be hanging around for whatever they think, you know, how this thing gets recapitalized or anything like that. Is that stuff that you're hearing? Because I keep, hear, keep hearing people say that, and I think I'm hearing it loud now that threads you know had such a great successful launch in such a short period of time i actually hear the opposite that that engagement at threads falling off a cliff and i have to say i've been i've been waiting to ask you this actually really curious if you've been using or what you think of it but i i don't really i haven't had a great experience with it so far to me it reminds me of clubhouse <laughs> <laughs> something that folks got really, really excited over that in theory was a good idea, but just wasn't sticky. And to me, I mean, my threads, I, I don't know how to change my following list and figure out how to do it, but I just want to replicate Twitter off of Twitter. That's all I want to use it for. I don't really want to see my friend's Instagram posts posted on threads. Yeah. Well, here, here's a couple things I'll just say on that. So the, the protocol in which Threads is being built on is going to make it so that you could transport your entire following. You can transport your um, entire, you know, um, you know all, all your data and all your content, which I think is actually really sort of interesting here. Okay. So the other thing I just say is I'm not an active social user. I've not been on Twitter for months. Um, and so, I, you know, I do have an Instagram. I think the ability to toggle back and forth between Instagram and Threads is really something that we have not seen from a mobile social app situation right now. Because if you think about it, if people are there for the Instagram to show their um, pictures of their kids or whatever the heck it is that they do over there, you could replicate that following on threads and you could follow news stories. And that really is, the, I guess the hope is that that's going to be the real time search engine, right? Which is what we all know Twitter to be. So you have these two things that you can toggle back and forth from. I think that is a really interesting concept. We have not seen that yet. You could have said, well, that's what kind of Twitter and spaces was or this, that, or whatever. It hasn't really been um, the case. So the way I'm thinking about it is it's a very disorganized Twitter right now. Okay. They obviously rushed this thing out in, in a very quick manner and they got to a critical mass that I think a lot of people are going to give them the benefit of the doubt here because I, listen, engagement on Twitter has dropped off like crazy. The advertisements are really bad. Even their own Twitter spaces, which we were all using a bit, you know, that stuck around a bit longer than Clubhouse wasn't particularly working. And so to me, I think that people are going to be willing to give this a shot. And especially if you buy into the fact that maybe, and, and listen, I, I think all of us giving Zuckerberg and Facebook a pass for all the, the misdeeds. It's wild. Oh, what, a, it, what a world we live in. <laughs> it, it, is, it, it is crazy. So but, we're rooting for Zuckerberg all of a sudden. Yeah, but maybe we've gotten to a place where they're actually really good at not amplifying anymore the stuff that makes us so angry and want to fight. I don't know. You know what I mean? But I'm, I'm so I'm so skeptical. And, and the only thing I would say about that, and I don't know if I'm the minority in this, this is purely anecdotal. I want less social media, not more. I do not want to be able to toggle between my Instagram and my Twitter. My Instagram is very private. My Twitter is very public. And I don't, I, I feel weird about seeing my friends on a Twitter-like platform. I don't know that I want to know <laughs> what they're thinking on a day-to-day -day basis. I want to hear what you're thinking on the market and companies and topics. Um, but it's, yeah, I, I don't know. It's just, it's not giving me something that I think is compelling so far. Yeah. Well, no, it, it, I, I do think it's interesting though, that going back to, let's say WhatsApp that has over 2 billion, you know, monthly active users, and they've never really turned on monetization. Right. So uh, in that, so, so Facebook or meta can spend a lot of time trying to iterate on this product and get it right. I was also very skeptical. Clubhouse was not a big fan. I thought that that space, that kind of live micro po uh, podcasting, whatever you wanted to call it was Twitter to lose because your social graph mapped to Twitter, right? And if you were inclined to kind of go on a Twitter space, that sort of thing. But it is interesting that people are just not interested in being on spaces anymore because you can just see that. You can see of your following who's on and what's being hosted. So that ended up being, you know, very ephemeral. Um, I am, I actually do think it's really interesting that if you, if we can put the Zuckerberg and the, the, the kind of 
you know, all the stuff that we went through from 16 and 18 in front of Congress and all this other stuff behind us. And you can think of a world where maybe those three properties really do segregate very different behaviors that you have on your mobile app. Um, and some of the integration and your ability maybe to transport a lot of the data. I don't know. It could be really interesting. And, and let me just tell you, D, and you've seen this. I mean, Meta was trading at 290, you know, when, when that, Threads was introduced, it's up 5% in a straight line since then. So investors are excited about it, even for a stock that's up you know, more than 200% from its 52-week lows. And I'm not telling you right or wrong that investors have this right, but it is interesting to see it confirmed, at least by the stock market. And isn't that amazing? We thought we were going to get the metaverse. Instead, we got a, a Twitter copy. And, and it does say something larger about social media and technology. And I think there was like a Jack Dorsey tweet, right? And he said something similar. He said, we thought we were getting autonomous vehicles. Instead, we got, you know, five different social media platforms that all look the same. Um, and, you know, I, I would just say that that Meta has been up. I mean, it's been a, such a remarkable performance this year on some really boring stuff, efficiencies, right? The Zuckerberg's year of efficiency and go, creating a, another copy. But that has been a really good business. Instagram itself, Right was a copy. It's copied aspects of Snapchat. Um, now it's doing Twitter. And that's, you know, it's just, it's a great second mover. And that's what investors like about Meta. But is it going to be the most innovative company? I, I don't know still. Yeah. So, and then the last one we'll just hit before we get out of here. Um, you know, like Netflix is, this is a stock that, you know, traded in late 2021, $700. Um, it traded as low as I think, um, $170. So uh, 700 to 170. Now it's up, you know, nearly 200% here. And, you know, when you think about it, um, you know, what's embedded in this, there was a time where we could have said six months ago that Netflix has never been cheaper. The positioning among a very crowded streaming space um, was probably never better, you know? Um, and, and so I think that as they get ready to report Wednesday after the close, it'll be really interesting to see how investors treat any sort of hiccups. And when I say hiccups, I don't think that any of us are expecting any major disasters other than the fact that these stocks have run so much. So, you know, like, and, and also so recently, you know, they're, they're obviously well off those 52 week lows, but they've really run into um, these prints. And, and so I'm just curious, what do you, do you have any sense for like, what do you think sentiment is? And will we be in a situation where investors will kind of shoot first and ask questions later? Or are they more inclined to say, okay, you know what? We had the bear market in 2022. We're in a new bull market here yeah. and it's not going to be a straight line higher. But so, you know, like, are, are they going to be more accepting, let's say, of maybe cautious guidance for the back half of the year? It's a good question. I think that for the streaming platforms and Netflix in particular, it's going to be all about this Hollywood writers and now actors strike. Um, how are they going to respond to that? What does that mean for the business? And I think that um, what they say is going to be so closely scrutinized because there's implications for other companies. Um, but what is it? Netflix is talking about video games again now. It seems to always do this when they hit a hiccup. Um, and they haven't, you know, really had a lot of success with it. So I I'm, I'm curious about their outlook for the rest of the year and how long they think that this Hollywood strike is going to last. Yeah, well, and I'll just say this. I mean, I give, I do give Netflix credit. In, in some instances, people are really shocked at how little visibility they have in like in kind of the user growth and the, and the volatility, you know, quarter over quarter. And the stock has historically been very volatile on that sort of number. And you bring up a great point when you start hearing about these other verticals where they could move into, you start saying to yourself, have they kind of tapped it out? Out, and then just like these other, you know, like, listen, if Disney's going to cut back on original content, the question is, is like, does Netflix need to keep their foot on the pedal, you know, as, as hard too? And so you start seeing, you know, flattening sort of growth as it relates to user growth and, you know, for demand for new content kind of abates a bit. And the key thing that Netflix loves to reiterate, which I think is totally fair, is that they are profitable. I mean, they're coming from such a, pos a better position of strength. They can afford to do this a little bit more than a Disney Plus. But it also raises interesting questions for the mega caps, right? The Amazon, the Apples that are spending a ton on sports rights and creating their own content. They don't really need to do that. It doesn't affect them as much the strike as it does Netflix. It'll be interesting to see if they if they actually keep you know what, what how they how they respond and if they put money into other growthier parts of their business. Yeah, last thing I'll just say this is that you know Spotify is also you know rallied you know two hundred percent off of its lows and I've kind of long thought if you're talking about other verticals for um, you know Netflix that that like streaming especially obviously 
audio, but their move into podcasting would really fit well, you know, into um, Netflix's business model. If you think about it, when you think about where margins are for Spotify, they're somewhere in the kind of mid to high 20s, um, where Netflix has got a higher margin, I think somewhere in the mid 30s or so. You say to yourself, this is a company that's supposed to be gap profitable um, next year in 2024. $34 $34 billion market cap, $30 billion enterprise value now that you know Netflix is at 200 I think that's a deal that regulators would probably let happen when you think about the size of the platform companies that Netflix is really competing with. When you think about Apple, you think about Amazon, right? You think about oh, Disney. Interesting. So, so to me, that's one I think is, is really sort of interesting, um, but who knows it'll ever happen. I love playing the, the, the dating game when it comes to M&A. I like know. that. I haven't heard. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. What do you think of Apple and Disney now? You know, it's funny. I, you know, I, I don't know about you. I, I feel like, I feel like, I feel like Bob Iger will figure this out. I feel like he'll get this thing right. And you know what I mean? And so he left it. We if anyone can do it. Yeah, it's him. But I mean, even to hear from him that this is so tough was kind of remarkable. Yeah, no doubt. Well, that'll be interesting. We're going to get Apple, I can think, the week after next, Disney in a couple of weeks too. So uh, it would be interesting to see how these stocks kind of trade into their prints here. They're all trading, you know, Apple's at a new all-time high. Microsoft today, again, at a new all-time high. Um, you know, the euphoria in the market, we have a NASDAQ 100 that's up 44% of the year. The NASDAQ's up 37%. The S&P's up, you know, 19%. At the end of last year, it just felt so dire. It just felt so dire. It's just pretty amazing. It's remarkable to people here in the Valley too. I have all these conversations. I mean, we thought last year, you know, some of the bankers would move out and stuff and (laughs) they didn't to their, to their delight because there's a lot going on here now these days. No doubt about it. All right. Well, listen, Dee, I really appreciate you joining me from one market out there in San Francisco. That's Deirdre Bosa. She is the host of CNBC. Tech Check. I appreciate it. Stick around for my conversation with Dan Turan and Rachel Neiman. Hey, Dan. What up, guy? You're into this fintech. What's all this I'm hearing about Current? You're going to like this guy. Current is a fintech company that's completely disrupting traditional banking. Wait a second. Does that mean I don't have to drive to the bank anymore? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I'm a new Current customer, and I manage all of my finances from one easy-to-use app. Well, I got to get this app, but where can I learn more? It's super easy. Just go to Current.com slash OK, O-K-A-Y, and download the app. That's Current.com slash OK. Current is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by and Visa debit card issued by Choice Financial Group, member FDIC, pursuant to a license from Visa USA Inc. and can be used everywhere Visa debit cards are accepted. Hey, it's Dan here. Are you tired of struggling with your weight? I know I was, and that's why I turned to Roe. They offer a revolutionary medication approved by the FDA specifically for weight loss. It's paired with lifestyle coaching, so the weight comes off and stays off. I started with a free online visit and connected with a U.S. licensed healthcare professional. They prescribed the medication that helped me drop 30 pounds in the last four months. And now Roe is offering a discount just for our listeners. To get our special offer, go to roe.co slash OK. You'll pay just $99 for the first month and $145 per month thereafter. If prescribed, medication cost is separate. That's ro.co slash OKAY. All right, welcome back to OK Computer. I am here with Dan Turan. He's the co-founder and managing partner at Gutter Capital. Many of our listeners know Dan from his prior contributions to the Fine Podcast here. I'm also here with Rachel Nemeth. Rachel is the co-founder and CEO at Opus, which is a training platform for deskless workers. We're going to get into all of that. We're going to get into why Dan invested, I think, pre-seed a few years ago, um, participated in your Series A round uh, not too long ago. Um, We want to hear about how your company has changed and, and the problems that you're looking looking to solve there and why Dan and Gutter have been a great partner um, for you. But welcome to the pod, Rachel. Thanks for having us. Good to be back. All right, let's do this thing because it's it's really interesting. Let's kind of set the stage. A lot of our listeners, um, they come to us for some of our market commentary and some of the stuff that we'll have to say about how markets are reacting to things going on in the economy. And one of the things right now, and I think this is, Rachel, very much in your wheelhouse. And I know, Dan, through some of your own views, but also the way you invest capital at Gutter, you guys are really focused on the macro, okay? One of the things that is confounding a lot of pundits like me, market participants, economists, strategists, is what's gone on in the workplace, okay? Well, and really specifically in the workforce, right? And so I think we were all this general consensus when this pandemic hit in 2020 that unemployment was going to go to levels that we have not 
not seen in a, in a really long time. No one knew how that was going to shake out. And really, if you think about it, um, the fact that we just, I think, had a June unemployment print of 3.6%, this is the one thing that's confounding a lot of folks here. So let's, can we start with the macro a little bit? I'd love to get your thoughts because you, as an entrepreneur and as somebody who's obviously been in the workforce for a while, um, this has been a theme that, that's very close to you. So I'm just curious. Talk to us a little bit about the macro and how you've gotten really focused on um, on the workforce in general in your professional endeavors. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> to start macro macro, we should start with our thesis uh, years ago when I first met Dan. Um, it was the line I rattled off to every potential investor I met, <laughs> which is that 80% of the global workforce doesn't sit at a desk all day, yet 99% of venture capital dollars are going to the 20% who do. So this is a largely underserved workforce to begin with, yet there's no shortage of need on the technological side. And when you look at what's happening today where employers are still facing unprecedented amounts of labor shortages, the quit rate is higher than ever. When you're seeing an entire generation retire early, an entire generation enter early, and this huge skill gap, we're not surprised <laughs> to see it. But I understand why it's confounding a lot of people. It really comes down to, um, I mean, particularly the businesses that we serve right now at Opus, they're continuing to grow and expand right now. And I won't get too far into it yet on the restaurant side, but um, – these employers can't cut labor. They have increased demand right now. They're consolidating their businesses. They're acquiring more businesses. So at least when it comes to frontline work, those numbers aren't dipping. Yeah, I think one other thing that's very interesting, I think that's a great setup in terms of where venture dollars have been invested. The other thing that happened in early uh, 2020 is we basically turned off the spigot on immigration overnight, so dropped by 75%. Um, over the past two years, it's recovered, but it's still 25% below the pre-COVID levels. And on a uh, workforce that's about 160 million workers, we're talking about millions of workers that just never came. And so when we look at the service services inflation and contribution to CPI, um, in particular for the lowest wage workers, which are often coming over our borders, um, you know, it's pretty clear why there's a shortage of those workers today. And I do think one of the things that's that's fascinating about the last um, couple of years is, you know, the other thing that everyone thought was going to happen in addition to unemployment was that the lowest wage workers, um, you know, were going to get hosed. And like the narrative even today is that inflation hurts poor people. When you look at the numbers, the lowest decile of workers who on average make twelve fifty an hour, they actually erased 40 years worth of wage drift away from the highest wage workers. They're the biggest winners, you know, from a wage perspective of all of COVID. And I think it's interesting how Rachel sees that play out day to day in what's become, you know, a knife fight for talent. Every store has a, uh, every si store has a sign in the window, help wanted. You see all these memes about trying to retain talent. Um, but that's like basically the business that that Rachel's in. Yeah. So it's interesting because, um, you know, the immigration piece is one that um, there was, you know, seven years ago, it felt like we were going to go in this way for tighter immigration. And then, you know, like this new administration comes in and, and we think that it, it's going to kind of open up some of those things. And, you know, I talk to a lot of folks um, who are far better schooled in economics than me and 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 whatever their political uh, affiliation is, they will put their finger on the fact that this is a huge problem for us in our country uh, on, on the employment front. And so the fact that we're still, I don't know, printing 60, 70 year lows and unemployment rate and you're your point about service inflation, that's not going away, right? Until we have like a loosening of the workforce and, and that sort of thing. So a little, so, so that's kind of the macro setup right now. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, like what are some of the problems that, and, and again, you know, frontline workers is something that you've been exposed to. It sounds like for a while, how has your thought process evolved as far as like the training and, and how, how you got to where you are? Because you, you did pivot a little bit, right? At oh, the, a whole uh, lot. Yeah, okay. All right. I want to hear about <laughs> Let's that. Let's not lie and, about and it. And we'll put this in the show notes a little bit because Dan, Dan wrote a great um, blog uh, on Gutter Capital, um, I, I think a few months ago when you participated in this series 
Musée, and it was really, it, it was, you know, telling a, a little bit of this. And your experience with Managed by Q is kind of interesting, too, because I remember when we first met in 2019, these were a lot of the same issues, some of the same problems that you were trying to solve with your company back then. So I'm curious, do you, you want to start a little bit with that pivot in, in, in 2020? Because it seems like you were just kind of the right person with the right experience and, and looking to do something that not too many um, other, at least startups, are, are looking to do right now to solve what, what is an increasingly challenging problem. Yeah. Um, the whole story is one for beers one day, uh, but I'll it. try to keep it short. Uh, so um, the whole story of what we were doing before COVID, for lack of a better term, was about access. It still is about access. This is about and, and is addressing the dearth of technology that's built for the 110 million American workers who don't sit at a desk all day. Um, that has not changed. What changed in March March 13th of 2020 is I think what the date was. Um, Dan had already invested in my previous company, ESL Works. We delivered English language training to employee cell phones, access problem number one, right? When 23% of the workforce doesn't speak English, how can you make them more productive and communicative? When COVID hit, um, we, uh, in a matter of seconds, uh, had lost an entire industry uh, and all of our business. We decided to stop invoicing customers, the majority of whom were multi-unit restaurants. We knew globally restaurants were shutting down. Um, but we saw a new rising need for safety training. This was a workforce that, unlike the three of us, had to go into work. They had to make food. They had to deliver it. So um, the pivot with a lot more in between was me calling Dan and saying, listen, ESL Works is over, but we have good technology that can get good accessible training to frontline workers. Let's deliver COVID safety training to employee cell phones for free. And then we decided to just figure out the business later. So it was about proving out and validating that this is about um, accessibility to good technology and knowledge so that, that you can actually use um, in a matter of what, two weeks? <laughs> yeah. So it yeah. seems like you're like the perfect example. And again, we kept on hearing that this, like the, uh, the pull forward or the digital transformation, the speed in which it happened. And so you just started out by saying it was a text-based thing. It was meant to be really simple. And especially if you think about some of these workers, the sort of devices in which they would rely on to get this sort of information. But it seems like you shifted um, fairly quickly to make this, uh, you know, uh, like uh, add a lot of texture to the platform. I'm just curious, Dan, at that point, like what, what did you see? And, and I remember you and I talking, um, a lot back then. I mean, these are things that are actually you guys care about. Like these are these. Are, this is not just wasn't just a business opportunity. You really felt like this was like a really great opportunity to kind of move a platform uh, ahead that was really necessary. I'm just curious. So, so, but at your point, you know, you were um, a seed sort of investor, um, but this was going to be something that you were going to spend some more time on and help kind of think about a bit. Yeah, I mean, I think like for us. So, just for context, you know, James and I had invested. Um, at the pre-seed, which I think was 2018, we invested again two years later, um, right as COVID hit in 2020. And then we ended up leading around following that and then investing at the A. So we, we've been investing uh, in Rachel and are grateful to have been working with her for a long time and, and consistently over the last uh, couple of years through, through lots of changes in the business. Um, I think sort of from first principles, like the insight that we were investing in never changed. Um, we were backing someone who had deep industry expertise. Rachel spent many, many years of her life running kitchens in New York City, including for Danny Meyer. She saw the problem firsthand. And as we understood it, it's sort of like what she said, in a nutshell, 110 million workers, and these tools are not built for them. They don't sit at a desk and they don't speak English. And when you look at the, there's something like 1,300 pieces of LMS learning management uh, software on the market um, that's been built over the last 20 years. And if you look at what they all have in common, they're built around someone who sits at a computer, has an email address, and speaks English. And so, you know, you know, in our business, we want to find a mission-driven founder, deep industry expertise, um, who's got a real insight that other people don't see. And that's what led her to the first iteration of the business, which was uh, SMS-based training for uh, English, functional English. Um, but in our view, sort of, you know, COVID kind of pulled forward what was always part of her vision, which was accessibility and the sort of uh, rich platform in terms of like our involvement, 
Yeah, I had the the good fortune of having uh, recently left WeWork. I literally didn't know what to do with myself. Um, and Rachel was one of the founders that I really admired that was doing something really interesting in the portfolio. She happened to have a need for some support. Um, and so when COVID hit and she decided to pivot the business, um, I was able to recruit some of my former colleagues from Managed by Q who ended up joining her as her co-founders and spend a little bit of time with them in the trenches as they replatformed. And, you know, ultimately it emerged a business that was much bigger than when it entered. And I think this is important for, you know, any, any part of the audience that's, you know, founders or investors or whatever, um, over and over again, like we're reminded that, um, we're all sailing the same sea. So these big macro events happen and there is always companies that thrive that you don't expect. And that is like, that is where good management really matters. And there are so many founders that would have been tapping the mat with half of the adversity that came at Rachel. And instead, like she came out of this with a much more interesting company. Um, and so we've continued to, to invest in her. So let's talk about the, the platform itself. So, so, you know, you went from this text based thing. It was really focused, and you have a, a background in English as a second language. So it seems like that seems like a, a perfect intersection, at least, you know, for um, this one industry. They're spending a lot of time so far talking about um, the the restaurant workers and such. But it sounds like. Um, this platform, you know, could be, uh, you know, used for a lot of different industries. So let's talk about the platform and let's talk about like, like the industry focus and, and how you kind of broaden it out away from, let's say, dense populated areas like New York City that have some very unique characteristics, but they're common among some of the largest populated population centers in, in, in the U.S. Yeah. So um, high level, what Opus does is is a skill training or skill building platform for businesses with a frontline workforce. Frontline used to be during COVID, it was uh, nurses and doctors. Um, now it's it's much broader. So um, cooks, servers, packers, pickers, drivers, you name it. Um, so what we are trying to do is basically break learning management systems and burn them to the ground and rebuild them for this population. Who, who I'm not going to be that polite about it. right now? If you're not going to be polite, there's let's 12, yeah. <laughs> what, what, does, what does it look like? Just give us a sense. Yeah. Well, there, there's over 1,200. This is the problem wow. is you can't name one that any of your listeners would uniquely identify. It's a highly fragmented market. So in order to solve for that, it isn't just being the next, you know, I'll name like Docebo. That's a publicly traded. There, there's lots of those companies. And it frankly isn't as simple as saying, okay, we're going to add every language under the sun into it. It has to start by doing the opposite of what they did, which is we proved out that what we were doing worked by starting with the end user. We didn't build anything for Bonnie and HR or Joe, the CEO. What we were doing was building directly for the frontline worker. That was the initial product was text message. And proving out that in under 12 seconds, we could get an employee training. It's about speed to market when you're doing what we're doing. When the turnover rate is 130% in some of these businesses, you have to get into the pockets and the hands of employees as fast as humanly possible so they don't leave. So we started there. Now, um, two years later, what Opus does is um, – helps employers, speaking of this speed to market problem, it helps them generate any kind of training under the sun for use cases like compliance, standard operating procedures, corrective action, new hire training uh, with our AI powered technology, while at the same time getting that to the hands of their frontline workforce in minutes. And then there's this last piece that a lot of people don't realize, I'm giving away the sauce right now, but <laughs> you have to build for the frontline manager. Anybody who has worked in any form or fashion in restaurants or who was a lifeguard or whatever knows that there was that one, you know, 21-year-old kid <laughs> who was a green manager and also needed the same level of coaching in order to, to be able to serve their team. So we built technology specifically for that person and what that means is that these companies get mountains of data on their workforce so that they can predict what's about them. All right. So, so it's interesting. You just kind of described what a lot of like, um, normies like me. Okay. So like, um, structuring unstructured data, doing <laughs> prediction stuff, you use, um, your AI powered this, that. Talk I had to, to throw me. it in yeah, there. No, I know, but, <laughs> I, but I, I think it's really important because I'm trying to make this point. 
Like, like the, the public markets have become captivated to the tune of trillions of dollars in market cap with a lot of stuff that all of these companies had been investing in and building in the background. They, you know, we've been using machine learning and AI, like these, these themes for a long time, but like, so, and, and I'm sure Dan, you guys, you and James over there at gutter, you're seeing a lot of business plans that have been reoriented in the last few months in and around these sorts of themes. But I'm curious, how were you thinking about like these sorts of technologies? Again, were you building them yourselves? Were you licensing them and integrating them into your own development? Just because these, this is a theme that public markets, whether you're a trillion dollar market cap or you're, you know, um, a, a series A, um, you know, technology enabled sort of, you know, like startup, you have to actually um, be thinking about this a little bit. Yeah. I mean, for us, when it comes to to LLMs or whatever you may be working with, in our case, it's about enhancement. Mm -hmm. It's not about proprietary technology. It's about leveraging it in meaningful ways. And for us, it's content. Nobody wants to pull, you know, to to open up a training management system and look at 10,000 courses for their workforce. They want to be able to customize it. So we are invested- you finding them pretty customizable, like some of the stuff that you guys are testing right yeah. now? Like, and is that, and this is, again, is this why we're having this moment, I think, both in, in public and private markets? Because for the first time in a long time, you have a, a commercial, a viable commercial, you totally. know, chat bot that people say, oh, I could integrate that into my yeah. thing. You probably didn't feel good about doing that a year and a half ago into some of the things that were on the market. A year and a half ago, we were investing in translation technology for obvious reasons. Um, so we wanted to be the best. Best. We wanted to do it fast. We wanted to get 99% accuracy. So we did that, right? We can translate any content into 100 global languages. But with the emergence of OpenAI being, you know, much more readily available for businesses like ours, it was the obvious choice. I still remember being in the room with our executive team and there, it wasn't even a discussion. It was, well, this solves the content problem. <laughs> this is how we do it. So it's not about, we aren't forcing AI into the product. We're solving a problem faster than we so you're not renaming the company Opus AI anytime soon? God, no. no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean. I we mean, did look for the URL, though. Yeah, well, of course. <laughs> yeah, you, I think we've had this conversation, um, you know, and James, my partner, despite literally he taught the course on AI at Johns Hopkins 15 years ago, uh, was the TA. Um, you know, we are also not an AI fund. We're not investing in base models. But our view is, you know, there is a generation of companies being built today just like companies like Salesforce and uh, Netflix, you know, were cloud companies, they weren't going around saying, um, you know, Netflix cloud, Salesforce cloud, like it is called Salesforce cloud now. Um, but they weren't pitching themselves as, as cloud companies. They were um, just application layer companies led by strong technologists that were playing on the front foot using the best technology available today. And in this case, you have Jeff, who's Rachel's co-founder and the CTO of the company, who's deploying novel technologies to solve problems that they understand well for the customer. And I think that's like, you know, the difference between there will of course be tremendous value created in people building the base models. That's not what, you know, Opus is building. That's not where we're so interested in investing. I don't think we do very well there, but I do think that, um, you know, every company will become an AI company. And I honestly, I recommend uh, checking out the use case and like the, the, application of, of AI at Opus is really quite incredible where you can give the, you know, give the application guidance on even like the, the voice and tone of the brand, what yeah. content you need to develop. Mm -hmm. And within moments, it's it's created interactive training content based on sort of some of their, their templates and formulations. So you, though, Dan, as like an advisor um, to a lot of the companies in your portfolio, I mean, like you're obviously now seeing lots of pitches that are like our AI first for all intents and purposes, but the way you just describe, you know, your, it, it, you know, how you've been working with Rachel and her team for years now, this was always a part of it. Right. So I'm just curious, like, you know, like, it, it, like the wheat from the chaff sort of thing, like, are you seeing just a rush of, of ideas that people think if it's led with AI, like are investable right now, given the, the moment that we're in. Um, and then just give me a sense of like, are a lot of your, portfolio companies like in a position like Rachel and her team are here where they've they they have been thinking about it they have been integrated yeah I mean I think like and I'm a little bit 
so Nicole here, having sat through the, the metaverse and uh, Web three and crypto, and watched you know my, well, you, my weren't, you, you you weren't a Web three fund. No, we show. haven't taken the That's bait uh, on any of it. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know we've all watched our our dear friends and colleagues tr change their Twitter bios over and over again. Um, so I'm a little bit cynical, but I do think that um, the difference between sort of these application layer companies today, the ones that win and the ones that don't, um, it's not clear to me that you know pitching yourself as AI first. I think. Um, there are plenty of investors who will pay a premium for a company that, you know, uh, can effectively convince them that it's an AI company. Um, but often, you know, they're not. Um, they're they're building application layer software, which is which is awesome. I do think that um, it's not clear to me that, you know, when we're sitting here in five years, seven years looking at um, sort of big winners from AI that are IPOing, that it's going to be the ones that had AI in the pitch deck, unless of course they're trying to build you know these big base models. But those those teams look very different. The capital required is very different, um, and I think the same way you know the big winners of cloud, not including the incumbents, um, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, um, it would have been really hard to predict. You know, if you look at like the most valuable um, public software companies today, and I don't think if you looked back that cloud was probably in most of their pitches. It just was a natural evolution of the business, yeah. again, to solve a customer problem they understood well. That, that, that's actually a really great analogy. And as somebody who's like a builder, Rachel, I mean, these are things that you have to, you know, contemplate, right? And you have like, like you know, very skilled people, your CTO and, and the like here, like this is this is what they do. You know what I mean? So like, I, I, I agree with that. There's a really funny moment and you guys, maybe we'll put it in the show notes. I think if you go back in like 2008, Larry Ellison had a hissy fit on an earnings call. Uh, he, literally, he kept on saying, what the hell is cloud computing anyway? And he's actually, he was making your point because people, it, you know, Salesforce was bubbling up and Betty Off was, you know, it, it, one of his ex-guys and everything like that. And it was just a really, you got to go listen to this video or, like, <laughs> because he's literally like, what, he's like, this is what we do. You know what I mean? Like, so I just think it's kind of interesting. Um, but let, let's talk a little bit about the business model here and where you guys, where, where you see opportunities because it seems like obviously we've spent some time um, you know, in deskless sort of workers, like how, how does it broaden out? You use the term also like multi, um, shop restaurants or, or yeah. something like that or whatever. This is not something that probably works well in a one-off sort of situation, like, like, like a mom and pop restaurant, that sort of thing. It really, is, is it really geared towards chains and, and that sort of thing? So, so talk to us a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's multi-unit groups. Uh, we made the decision to start with multi-unit restaurants. It's the second largest employer in the United States. There's a million restaurant locations in the U.S., 650,000 of them are part of multi-unit groups. It's an obvious solution. Um, I'm biased because I worked in that industry for 13 years, and so did my mom and my grandpa, so I knew all of these problems. Um, but uh, the way that we're um, thinking about the world with mid-market and enterprise is really important because it's about impact. Our mission is to create a world where every frontline worker has a good job. I can't do that by selling directly to SMBs. I have to get market share. And so um, when you also look at the way that markets are shifting, particularly in restaurants, when times get tight, they consolidate. They buy up real estate and they open up shop. So we saw this in the last recession. Whatever you may feel about what's coming, um, you're already starting to see – uh, you know, Roos Chris was just acquired by Darden. You're seeing uh, Kava went public. Sweetgreen is doing some stuff with automation. <laughs> they're all <laughs> they're all investing in multiple ways in order to get a bigger footprint. So that's where we set our sites so that we can reach more. And does automation, it's funny, before the pandemic, it's interesting. Um, and again, that is like the the pure definition of a black swan event, right? But remember, we were obsessed. The robots are going to take the jobs yeah. and like, you know, like <laughs> robot pizza makers and all that sort of stuff. And, and it's interesting. Now we are like on the other side of this thing. And it seems like low single digit unemployment for all the demographic shifts and the immigration issues and all this other stuff, the way supply chains have kind of reoriented. It seems like we're, that's here to stay. So this seems like this is a problem you're going to be working on uh, and hopefully succeeding every step of the way for a long time. And I'm just curious, was that fascination or the fear of automation in hindsight, was it always silly in a way? Because you've heard that example of like, well, when ATM machines came around 40, 50 years ago, it was going to be the death to the, the, the bank teller. Well, actually it wasn't. I have lots of opinions about automation. I'll keep it simple. <laughs> that the biggest burning problem with these businesses, whether it's retail, whether it's restaurants or manufacturing, is one of two things. 
and they both tie up to one central goal. The problem is either customer experience or it's productivity in the back end. So if you have a manufacturing facility, how can you get more output? So when we think about automation, a lot of people will talk to us about, you know, well, rest, McDonald's is putting up kiosks. Well, that doesn't actually change the need for training your team more effectively on how to engage with those customers. The reason why McDonald's puts in those kiosks is a little bit, of course, to address the labor shortage. But it's also so that those employees can spend more time producing and driving revenue so managers can stay on the floor and not have to be coaching people you know, every five seconds. So the technology for automation is also enhancing the frontline worker. I'm all for it. I think it's fine. And we don't see it really impacting our world at all. But what it all pipes up to, if you really th- want to think 30, 50 years from now, even if employers are cutting labor over time, they're not cutting it as a means of lowering output. So it's really important to address the skill gap so that as I'm paying you more money, as I'm trimming back the workforce, I expect you to be producing more. So that's why what we're constantly pushing for is productivity as a value proposition. Retention is important, mind you, but there's natural churn in frontline jobs. You can't solve it the same way you can in software. So Dan, what are, what are some like kind of milestones when you think about um, Opus and you think about like the business and 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 obviously they have all the data that they're tracking uh, internally as a business. But you, as somebody who thinks a lot about a lot, you know narrowing skills gaps and, and and that sort of thing, and and I know that you're concerned about like very American problems given our u- unique situation. I'm just curious, like what are some of the things that you you know like that, that as you think about this as a as a portfolio company, but also as a business that you're very interested in? What are some of the things we should be watching for? Yeah, I mean, obviously, like I can't speak to to the the business's you know internal metrics, but I think some of the things that we've been most excited to see as the company has grown and developed is, um, you know, there's kind of a few ways to slice it, but one is the customers they're solving. So we've talked a lot about restaurants, but they're also solving solving the problem for university campuses, uh, golf courses, industrial manufacturers, um, home builders, like kind of list goes on and on. Um, and so it's been exciting to see them penetrate into new categories who have similar problems. And then also I think just thinking about sort of the the depth at which the problem is solved and sort of uh, moving beyond just like this very basic training to really like a frontline engagement tool. Because at the end of the day, I think training is a piece of the puzzle. Um, But if you are the CEO of a large restaurant group um, in a market where um, you want to understand who your best performers are, and Opus can help you do that now because you have this sort of frontline um, visibility. But then also, like, you might want to be able to communicate with people directly and sort of creating these new types of tools for having, like, this connective tissue throughout the organization. It's just seeing it kind of step beyond just being um, a basic utility and really creating something that that's new and differentiated for, for this customer. All right. Well, listen, I, I learned a lot. I still, I, I'm, I'm still going to be the clueless uh, market pundit guy on the unemployment <laughs> front. It's going to confound me for a while. And you know, it's funny. I mean, we go back and forth and listen. I, like, it's a great thing that we have unemployment where it is, right? Like, like the last thing, if, if the Fed's success in battling inflation is getting unemployment above 5%, I think yeah. that's a weird world to sort of be in. But, um, you know, and, and it's also, Rachel, really great to hear some of the things that you have to say about automation, because that was the fascination, you know what I mean? Like, like prior to the pandemic. And hopefully, you know, platforms like yours and people who are mission driven like you can help solve some of these problems here. That's what we hope. (laughs) Next time you're listening to Darden or whoever on their earnings call talk about labor labor productivity, now you know they're talking about (laughs) AI generated courses with Opus. Yeah. Well, listen, Rachel, I really appreciate you coming by and chatting with us. 